Righty. So, <laughs> I'm Paige. I'm back again with my whiteboard, with my whiteboard pen. You might remember me. I did a video on stars and today I thought we'd move on to exoplanets, another very exciting topic in astrophysics. I am an astrophysics student and I've got my final university exams coming up. So I've obviously had to be revising astrophysics recently, but also I want to make videos. So I've combined the two. I am talking to you guys about the stuff I am revising for my degree. So I can be revising and teaching at the same time. Don't we just love that. Genius plan from me, if I do say so myself. Everyone wants to do research on exoplanets. It's the hot area, the hot topic to be working on. So let me give you an introduction. I'm sure you've all heard of planets. They are an astronomical body which is orbiting a star usually and they are massive enough to be rounded by their own gravity. So they are a spherical shape but they are not massive enough to have thermonuclear fusion reactions happening inside of them so remember stars have fusion reactions occurring inside of them and they're releasing energy planets not large enough for this to happen they're not hot enough inside for fusion reactions to occur and what are exoplanets because they are the topic of this video exoplanets are planets that are not in orbit around our sun so our solar system has eight planets but there are lots of other other planets out in the universe that are not orbiting our sun, that are not in our solar system. Exoplanets is a relatively new area of astronomy. The first exoplanet wasn't detected until 1991 and that exoplanet was actually orbiting a pulsar, which is not a regular star like our sun. A pulsar is a rotating neutron star, which is a very dense body which is formed from the remnants of a massive star after it has exploded in a supernova, which is the death of a star. The first exoplanet orbiting a solar type star, a star like our sun, was detected in 1995. This was detected by Coelho and Major, who actually won the Nobel Prize for Physics last year for this discovery. Fast forward from 1995 to 2020 and we've now discovered over 4,000 exoplanets and more are being detected as we speak. It's currently thought that most stars have at least one exoplanet. It's a a really exciting area you know we're interested in finding planets that are like the earth if we can find planets like the earth they could be hosting life forms we could find aliens we're interested in finding out how unique is our solar system are there other systems like it the big question is how common is life in the universe now we can detect stars because they're very bright sources of light but it's not so easy to detect planets directly if this is our parent star and then we have an exoplanet it in orbit around it and we train our telescopes on this system the light from the parent star and the glare from this is going to completely drown out any reflected light we get from the planet remember the light from the planet is going to be reflected light from the star since there's no thermonuclear fusion reactions occurring in the planet it's not releasing energy itself actually having said that there are a few exceptions and some planets are self-luminous but the majority of light we are getting from planets is reflected light from their parent star if this tiny planet is really faint compared to its host star we're not going to see it through our telescope we're not going to detect it by direct imaging there is some work being done in high contrast imaging and some exoplanets have been detected by direct imaging where a coronagraph has been used to block the light from the central star but the vast majority of exoplanets we've detected have been detected by indirect methods the first method we can use to detect exoplanets is radio Radial velocities. An object's radial velocity is the speed with which it's moving away from the Earth. Imagine we, as an observer, are standing on the Earth. Here's a distant star. Here's the line of sight between us and the star a straight line, its speed in that direction is its radial velocity. Now usually we think of really small objects orbiting massive objects and the massive object in the centre remains fixed in position. However, this isn't technically correct. If you have a large object and a small object, they are actually both orbiting around their centre of mass. The centre of mass is obviously closer to the more massive object. The more massive object is also performing little mini wobbles around the centre of mass. Let's apply that to a star and a planet. The centre of mass will actually um, usually be within the star. So here's the star. If this is the centre of mass, then it's going to 
kind of go around like that. You can tell I'm not an artist. Essentially, the star's not going to be fixed in position. It is wobbling, orbiting the center of mass of the system because of the presence of an exoplanet. This wobble is going to affect the star's radial velocity, which we can measure using features in the light we get from stars. If we view these periodic changes in a star's radial velocity, we can deduce the presence of a planet. The second method we can use to detect exoplanets is transit photometry. This method has been by far the most successful so far and we've detected the most exoplanets so far using this method. This star is emitting lots of light which we are receiving into our telescope. We can plot a graph of brightness of the star against time. Now usually the star's brightness will be up here, say this is the intensity of light we are receiving from the star. However, if it's got an exoplanet orbiting it, here it comes around here, and the exoplanet's in front of it, this planet is going to block some of the light from the star, so the overall brightness of the star is going to be decreased down to a lower level. The exoplanet is going to take a finite amount of time crossing in front of the star. There is going to be that amount of time where the brightness from the star remains at this level, until it returns to its previous intensity. The light curve of the star is going to look something like this. The basics of this idea is a star emits lots of light, the planet blocks some of the light, this reduces the overall brightness that we see through our telescopes. We see this change in the light curve of the star, that is the graph of brightness against time. We deduce the presence of the planet. Hey presto. We've got to give a mention to this next method of exoplanet detection because it was the method use to detect the very first exoplanet and that is pulsar timing. Now pulsars as I mentioned earlier are rotating neutron stars and they emit radio waves, a form of electromagnetic radiation, at very regular time intervals. We can measure the time between arrivals of these radio waves on Earth and if there are periodic departures from the expected arrival times of these radio waves we can deduce that the pulsar is moving. It is wobbling around the centre of mass of the system because it's got an exoplanet orbiting it. With pulsars, it's the same principle as when a planet is orbiting a star. That looks like such a mess. I don't know how to draw these little wobbles. If here is the big star, here's the centre of mass. It moves round to here. It moves round to here and so on. So it's orbiting around this centre of mass. That's a better diagram. <laughs> the wobble of the pulsar is motion of the pulsar and that affects the arrival times of the radio waves we receive from the pulsar and so we can detect the presence of an exoplanet orbiting it. We've actually only detected seven exoplanets in total via this pulsar timing method which would suggest that it's not that common for exoplanets to be orbiting pulsars relative to the number of exoplanets that are orbiting orbiting solar type stars. The fourth method we can use to detect exoplanets is gravitational microlensing. I'm going to try explain this as best I can but I'm not going to go into details. Imagine we have a foreground star here, us as an observer on the earth, and a background star here. We have alignment between the foreground star and the background star along our line of sight. The light emitted from this background star can be bent by the gravitational field of this foreground star. This foreground star acts as a lens and it magnifies this light from the background star. If the foreground star has an exoplanet orbiting it, this significantly affects the light curve that we receive and we can detect the presence of a planet. I'm not going to go into it any further, but that's the general idea. I thought I'd give a quick mention to this final technique. It is the search for radio signals from extraterrestrial civilizations, i.e. looking out for radio signals from aliens. There are currently projects which hope that we might receive signals from extraterrestrial civilizations, advanced life somewhere in the universe. However, our current technology would require them to be beaming a really powerful signal towards us for us to pick up on it. My lecturer was very doubtful that this will give us much results. We haven't detected any exoplanets this way. We haven't found any aliens or intelligent life outside of the earth yet. But that's not to say it's not there. The the universe is a very big place. I think we'd be very naive to believe we were alone in the universe. I've just realised I spelled extraterrestrial wrong. <laughs> Let's fix that, shall we? Extra 
terrestrial. I did use to score quite well on spelling tests at school. So yeah, here are the five detection methods I've decided to discuss with you guys. There are more, but these are all the main ones. We could perhaps have looked at direct imaging slightly more. Although it's difficult to detect exoplanets by direct imaging because they're so faint, it is possible and some high contrast imaging has been fruitful, has given us actual detections of exoplanets. We should quickly talk about the habitable zone though before we finish up. For life on Earth, we need liquid water. It is a requirement. Therefore, we assume that extraterrestrial life requires liquid water as well. This might not be true, but I think it's a reasonable assumption that we've made. Now, imagine an exoplanet in orbit around a star. If the exoplanet is close to the star, it's going to be very, very hot. If the exoplanet is far away from the star, it's going to be very, very cold. Now, there is a region say this is our region here, at a set distance from the star where liquid water can exist on the surface of the planet, i.e. the planet is warm enough that the water's not ice and it's cold enough that the water's not water vapour. This region here is called the habitable zone because liquid water can exist on the surface of the planet so we could imagine life happening on the planet because liquid water is available at the surface. The habitable zone is often called the Goldilocks zone as well because in the tale of Goldilocks and the three bears she complains about her porridge being too hot or too cold but eventually she gets some porridge that is just right. We estimate that about 20% of stars have an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone. This gives lots of potential for extraterrestrial life, so very exciting. And <laughs> that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope I explained things somewhat clearly, but please do comment down below if you want anything clarified. I hope you're all doing well and what's oh, a fun activity. Oh, I know. Comment down below your favourite constellation. Mine is Orion. And I know that's basic, but it's the one that I can always identify in the sky no matter what. I'm no expert on the constellations. I'm still trying to train myself to recognise them all. If you don't really know much about constellations and you can't identify any yourself, then I would really recommend downloading the app Planets on your phone. It literally gives you a projection of the night sky on your phone and you can point your phone in any direction and it will literally name the constellation for you. I am going to get back to my revision now and try some practice questions on exoplanets. I have my own channel called Page Y and I'll link that in the description and I'll link my Instagram in the description if you want to keep up with what I'm personally up to and make sure you're subscribed to the study tube project as well make sure you're following the study tube project on Instagram and I think that's it I'm gonna head off thanks for watching bye <laughs>